You are listening to the Healing Migraines Naturally podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Leslie Caesar, and I'm helping women rediscover a migraine-free life. Today, I'm talking to Mary, who runs our awesome Facebook community, about why medications cause side effects. Welcome, Mary. How are you? Doing great. How's it going? Good. So what do you think about this topic today, talking about medication side effects? I feel like we need about three hours to cover it all. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much, so many side effects, so many problems that people face that it's a pretty big can of worms, I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is probably one of the most common questions we get in the free Facebook group, Healing Migraines Naturally with Leslie Caesar ND. People asking, you know, have you tried this medication and what side effects have you gotten? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I mean, I actually think that's probably the number one question, like above and beyond anything else, honestly. But it's kind of sad because it really doesn't matter what someone else's side effects are because you don't know how it's going to affect you. So, I mean, it's nice to like get some idea of what to expect, but really you're still going in blind, right? Yeah, for sure. What I think is really interesting is how much people have come to expect side effects. That is a very good point. Like, oh, this is just the norm. I better get ready. And I think I also get the sense when people ask this question, you know, this isn't their first rodeo with medication and medication side effects. They've been burned in the past and they're feeling desperate. They've been recommended something new because everything they've been doing has stopped working. But since they've experienced side effects in the past, they're a little gun shy to start something new and they want to research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, it, my heart just goes out to everybody because like, like I said, if you're, you're saying like, if you're just going in knowing, okay, take your medicine, embrace yourself. That's not really how we want to live either. And remember, we did a question. This was gosh, probably more than a year ago, we did a question in the Facebook group asking people, what would you rather have debilitating side effects or migraines? And the answer overwhelmingly was I'd rather have debilitating side effects. Which is interesting though, in and of itself, because like, I completely get it. Migraines make it so hard to function and they're so awful and miserable. But to choose that, it's like, the worst game of would you rather ever, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but on top of that, like it's really interesting because some of the side effects are so bad that the would you rather game isn't right. Like how many people say, Oh, I quit taking Topamax because I couldn't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning, which, you know, for me, that's just kind of a symptom of old age anymore, (laughs) but (laughs) they call it Dopamax for a reason. Right. Yeah. And it got to the point where even the side effects were not worth what they were getting out of it. So let's talk about why does medication generate side effects, right? It's a pretty interesting question. We just assume that the medication is going to generate side effects. We have come to tolerate the fact that we're going to have to deal with side effects after medication. But why does medication generate side effects in the first place? Why don't we talk about this? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm very interested to hear what you say about this. (laughs) So first of all, let's talk about the three, what I call the three principles that are required to restore and maintain our health. Because if you've been following the podcast, you've heard me talk about these three principles before. Everything comes back to these three principles. So for us to maintain our health, for us to be in a state of health, there are three things that have to be in place. We have to be able to get the nutrients to every cell in the body that every cell needs. Every cell in the body requires nutrients to function. And so the first principle to restoring and maintaining our health is to get those nutrients to the 30 to 40 trillion cells in the body. That's what I call the first principle. The second principle is clearing metabolic waste material. So when our cells do their work, they generate metabolic waste material. Those have to be removed from the cell and ultimately detoxified and removed from the body. Okay, you can open up any physiology textbook and read about this. So our cells are not going to function properly if they're swimming in toxins. So that's the second principle. And the third principle is restoring our resiliency and vitality. 
there's an organizing energy to every living system. There's an organizing energy to our body. And when that organizing energy is in homeostasis, in balance, we feel good. We are in what we call a state of health. So we have to have the resiliency and vitality to maintain this homeostasis. So these three principles, when we take medication, these three principles are affected. So first of all, when we take medication, medication, different medications will deplete different nutrients. This is very well documented. And so if we're taking a medication that has a nutrient depleting effect, well, wouldn't that impact the status of those nutrients at the cellular level? So when you say nutrient depleting, meaning it's blocking our bodies from collecting the nutrients we need or am I understanding that? Great question. So there are some medications like statin drugs that actually prevent our body from making certain nutrients like CoQ10. Uh, statin drugs also can block our body from making certain hormones. So again, at the cellular level, we have to have the hormones that are required for signaling and we have to have nutrients at the cellular le level for, the, for our cells to function properly. So we can be taking a medication that actually prevents the body from generating certain nutrients that are required. So that would have an impact within this first principle. Many medication shut down proper digestive function. So medications, acid blocking medications like amiprazole, Prilosec, Nexium, these are some of the most widely taken medications, widely prescribed and taken over-the-counter medications. Those prevent the stomach from generating the acid that it requires to break our food down. If we don't have adequate acid in the stomach, we're not going to break the food down properly. And in particular, we have to have an acidic environment in the stomach for us to absorb the minerals that are in the food. So we can take medication that actually block our digestive function, preventing us from breaking the food down, getting the nutrients out of the food. Therefore, they're going to, we're going to have some deficiencies getting them into the body, getting them to the cells. And then there are other medications that for the body to process them, the body has to use up nutrients in order to process that medication. So then we can develop nutrient deficiencies because we have this extra demand for nutrients that are now being used, not for our cellular function, but for processing the medication that we're taking. Interesting. I would never know that. That's awesome. Dude. You know, when we take the medication, we think, okay, well, this is doing something to take the pain away or take the symptom away. But what's really happening at a biochemical level within our body? We have to think that through. And these things are all documented before drugs are released, before they're approved and released on the market. But how many doctors, how many prescribing doctors are taking that into effect when they're giving it? The approach is, let me give you something to take the symptom away. There isn't the thought of, okay, is this actually going to further diminish your health? That is not part of the equation. So again, we have the symptom in the first place because we have some deficiencies or blockers or missing pieces within these three principles. The first principle being we do not have nutrients at the cellular level for the cells to function properly. And then we are going to take something that can further deplete those nutrients at the cellular level, either directly such as shutting down nutrient production in the case of CoQ10 or indirectly if we have a situation where it's shutting down digestion or kind of poaching other nutrients, poaching nutrients in order to process the medication. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know of any doctors that I've ever heard that have said, we're going to give you this, but now you're going to have to like double up your nutrition to make up the difference. Like you don't hear that, right? Absolutely. I don't think I've ever had a client tell me that their doctor told them that, not in the least. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so that is how these medications are impacting the first principle. Now let's take a look at the second principle, which is clearing metabolic waste material from the body. Now the medication itself is a toxin that has to be cleared from the body detoxified by the liver and the kidneys, and then removed, excreted, or eliminated from the body. 
So again, we have a symptom that we're taking a medication for, and then we're going to take something that further adds toxins, further add to the problem that we're already suffering from. Now, when these medications, again, before they are approved and released, they have to document, okay, what are the detoxification pathways that the liver uses to clear this medication? And they have to determine, okay, how long does that take? If something is more toxic, it's going to take longer to get cleared from the body. And so then they will determine what is called a half-life. Oh, I was just going to ask you about that. (laughs) Like, is that the same thing as the half-life? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the half-life is how long does it take for, if you might say, like a healthy liver or kidney or the average liver or kidney to process, to break down and eliminate from the bloodstream half of the dose, half of the medicine. That is the half-life. So in general, the more quickly a medication wears off, the shorter the half-life. I just have to understand, like, why did somebody decide to only measure half of it? (laughs) I think that is so weird to me. Okay, great question. Great chemistry question. So (laughs) you have to appreciate how is this drug going to finally get out of the body? That's going to be very difficult to determine. You could have one molecule still circulating. How are you going to measure that in a blood sample? You won't be able to pick that up. So the half-life, it allows enough to be cleared where they can measure the difference between sort of like the full dose and when half of it is cleared. But it doesn't require them to have, you know, we don't have the technology to measure when something is finally cleared from the body. So it sounds kind of like we don't have a way to be a hundred percent certain, so we're just gonna only get to a certain point or whatever. <laughs> like I don't know. That's really interesting. The other thing that we have to appreciate too is that when we take let's say we take an Advil. So the body starts to break that Advil down. It starts to process that ibuprofen and starts to break down the ibuprofen so that it can be eliminated from the body. So you're going to have sort of half broken down ibuprofen molecules circulating in your bloodstream as well. These toxins, the vast majority of toxins, they don't just go through the liver once and then they can be eliminated. They've got to go through multiple times. And each time they go through, the liver makes a little little atomic change, a little change to the structure of the molecule. So ibuprofen, right, it's going to, you have the ibuprofen, that little ibuprofen molecule is going to go through the liver and then that'll be slightly molecularly changed, but it still won't be able to be eliminated. And then that little change molecule is going to leave the liver. It's going to have to circulate all around and come back to the liver again and the liver will make another little tiny change. So this process Depending on the on the substance, this can happen, you know, 10 times. So each stage, you're going to have like a slightly altered little toxin molecule. So if we take an ibuprofen, then we have, you know, millions of little half altered ibuprofen molecules, little ibuprofen molecules that are in some stage of being detoxified and broken down. They're still going to have some effect on the body. But not necessarily pick up on a test. That's a good question. I would have to assume, so you would have to have different testing to pick up these little metabolites. Right. Okay. So I guess my question is like on a scientific level, like they may not actually be able to tell they're in there, but that doesn't necessarily not mean that they're not affecting their body still. And then at the same time, our body is trying to protect us from these toxins that are circulating. And so the body will pull these little ibuprofen molecules or slightly changed ibuprofen molecules out of the bloodstream and store them in our adipose tissue, our fat cells, our muscle cells, our joints. That's a protective mechanism because it's like, oh, wait a minute, what's all these toxins doing here? These are toxic. I don't want them in the bloodstream where they can cause damage. I'm going to put them in storage. So they could fit in those adipose or fat cells, like you're saying, for who knows how long. For a long time, right? They have done biopsies of people's adipose tissue or fat cells and found thousands of toxins in biopsied fat cells. 
and also kind of terrifying. <laughs> and we all know how easy it is to get rid of fat cells. So <laughs> whatever is going on in there, they like to hang on for dear life. <laughs> well, this is, uh, you raise a really good point because if I'm storing something toxic in my fat cell and I'm not going to want to open up that little fat cell and release those fatty acids and re-release that toxin. So this is a big reason why people have difficulty losing weight because the body is hanging on to those adipose cells because it is protecting us from the toxins that it has stored in there. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, something that you never would even think about. So you can appreciate when we take this medication over and over again, how it can actually build up in the body. Right. And then our body is going to slowly release these things. Okay, well, I stored these because I had a big influx of ibuprofen. So I stored a bunch of these little metabolites. Now let me try to get them out of the body. And so then the body will start to drip, drip, drip those stored toxins back out into the bloodstream. So then it's like we have almost a low dose, continuous low dose of that ibuprofen. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Even when you don't need it, it's low dosing. Exactly. And these things are toxic. So as they are circulating around and bumping into our cells, they're causing damage. So again, we're taking something that's toxic to the body. Our body is already generating metabolic waste material or toxins. That's normal. So then we're, our liver and our kidneys and our lungs, the three organs of detoxification, they have to keep up with the load that we're generating. When we're putting something in from the outside, we're adding to that. So when we have an accumulation of drug metabolites, the drugs don't work as well. If I have, think of this kind of little drip, drip, drip of these ibuprofen molecules that are getting dripped out of our adipose tissue. So then I'm kind of always under the influence of ibuprofen. Well, what's going to happen when I take ibuprofen for a migraine? it's not going to be as effective. So the body literally built up a resistance. I always wondered if that was just kind of like, oh, we're, this isn't working. So we just guess that it, our body builds up a resistance. But like, there's literally, if you're dosing yourself a little bit all the time, your body stops responding to it because it's just too used to it almost. Correct. And this happens with caffeine. People start drinking coffee. Oh, I'm a little tired in the morning. Let me have a little four to six ounces. <laughs> Ten years later, they're having the, the venti at Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> so many of us are coffee drinkers and we can experience this with caffeine. You can obviously, the notorious example with this is people who, you know, abuse alcohol, abuse, you know, heroin, things like that, right? This is well known. You have to consume more and more alcohol to get the effect. You have to have more and more heroin to have the effect. Interesting. Right? So the prescription medication is no different. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I would just say we don't think about it on such, like such innocuous type drugs like ibuprofen. Exactly. Like we just basically, I mean, I know we've talked about that in previous things where we just, this is the medical norm. So how many of us live on ibuprofen on a regular basis you know like that's just part of life so we don't think about it absolutely i mean it's very common for people to take prilosec daily it's a very common for people to be on statin medication for cholesterol that's other than antidepressants that's the most common medication prescribed so right, we've got two very common medications that shut down our digestive function and then prevent the body from generating hormones and and nutrients like coq10 that's pretty normal. And then like you say, Advil, I haven't got time for the pain, right? How often do you see commercial for an ibuprofen product? Great. All the time. All the time. And I think, like I said, it's just so normalized that like, even if I didn't see a commercial, I'm not going to lie, I take ibuprofen normally several times a week. And I'm noticing that it's hurting my stomach. So I'm trying to cut back. But yeah, like that's just normal life. Right. I mean, all NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so that would be things like ibuprofen, naproxen, all of those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have that class of drugs impairs digestive function. 
that's well documented. That's on the label. And I'm sorry, but you can fill it after a while. <laughs> like you don't even need proof. It really does mess your stomach up. Yeah, sure. you can feel it. Right, exactly. So again, over and above some effects that the medication might have, if we are swimming in drug metabolites, why wouldn't that affect the function of our cells? And then, of course, we're going to, again, if we think about caffeine or alcohol or heroin, of course, we're going to have to take more and more of the drug to get the same effect. And eventually it stops working. So that is the second principle when it comes to medication. The third principle, our resiliency and vitality. Our vitality directs that organizing energy of the body. Remember I said that every living system has an organizing energy that keeps it in homeostasis, keeps it in balance. So when that organizing energy gets a little bit out of whack, it's a little bit untuned, that's when the body generates symptoms. Now, the body is always generating the symptoms for a reason. We humans are highly adaptive. We are very unique. Most animals have to live, you know, they have to eat a certain, you know, they have to eat particular things. They have to live in, at certain altitudes or certain latitudes. We are a very, very unique animal. We can live from the North Pole to the equator. We can eat all different types of, different types of foods and thrive. With our adaptability comes the ability to adapt to the environment. So what we call symptoms are actually adaptations to the environment. That's an interesting way to look at it. Right? So if we have a little bit of a nutrient deficiency and we have a little bit of buildup of metabolic waste material and toxins, we don't just drop dead. We can adapt to those conditions. If we are living in an environment that's taking a toll on us mentally and emotionally, we don't just drop dead. We adapt to the environment. Some animals, they're nocturnal. They're awake at night. They sleep during the day. Other animals are awake during the day and they sleep at night. We humans, we are designed to be up during the day, but we have conscious control over when we go to sleep. We can stay up all night. The body is going to have to adapt to that environment. So we are highly adaptable. <laughs> Why can't it be like, I don't know, I'm adapting, but I now have superpowers. <laughs> Right. Like, why do yeah. have to be an adaption that like debilitates us? I don't like that's not right. Right. We want to do whatever we want and then not have any response from our body. But we can do we have a tremendous amount of conscious control over what we do, but the body has to adapt to that. And that adaptation is what generates symptoms. Symptoms are a response, it's an adaptation to the physical, mental, emotional environment that we are in. And our life force, if you will, directs that adaptation, directs that adaptation. And then we experience what we call symptoms. So then we go in and we take something that alters that adaptive expression. We try to shut that adaptive expression down. When you do that, you are interfering with that life force. And that also has consequences. So when we go in and interfere with that adaptive process, it depletes our vitality. This is the third principle that's required for us to feel good. So you can see when we take medication, we are impacting all three of these principles. So then what's going to happen? Our body is going to adapt to that. That's what it does whenever these three principles are kind of given a hit. Our body adapts to that and that adaptive response generates new symptoms. So rather than generating the symptoms of a migraine like we're used to, the adaption becomes your brain is sluggish or foggy or I'm trying to think, speaking of brain fog, trying to think of all the symptoms that people experience. Weight gain, weight loss, hair loss, all of those other things, right? Exactly. So like, let's take a look at hair loss. So for the hair follicle to generate hair, you have to have nutrients at the follicle. The hair follicle cannot be swimming in metabolic waste material and toxins if it's going to function properly. And then we have to have enough cellular vitality to generate hair. 
So if we're taking something that depletes our nutrients or prevents the nutrients from getting in, diminishes our digestion, interferes with our appetite, so we feel like eating food, continues to add more metabolic waste material and toxins, and interferes with our vitality, well, maybe your body stops generating hair. Anyway, we only have like a certain amount of, I guess, I don't know, spoons for lack of a better word, full of energy in a day, including on a cellular level. So if I'm burning up all my energy as a cell fighting against the toxins in my body, I don't have enough energy to produce hair. Like kind of you're pulling the source of nutrition, you're pulling the source of energy away from your hair. So therefore, you no longer grow hair. Is that kind of very dumb version of what you said? <laughs> and just like some people are prone to certain symptoms when they're not in a state of health, people are prone to certain side effects. And so if you are prone to hair loss, that you could be prone to that as a symptom and you can be prone to that as a side effect. That's interesting. I didn't realize like, I didn't ever think of it that way. Some people will say, you know, when I'm sensitive to medication, it always affects my stomach. Or if I'm sensitive to a certain medication, oh, yeah, I get real foggy. If I'm sensitive to a medication, I can't sleep. What do you think collectively most, like the worst symptom of, you know, side effect of medication is to deal with? The worst side effects are the side effects that directly add blockers to these three principles. So if you're taking a medication like Prilosec, a PPI, an acid blocking medication, and that could even be Tums. So if you're taking a medication that is shutting down your digestive tract, well, it's going to be even harder to get the nutrients into the body then because you don't have adequate digestive function. So if you are taking a medication that is extremely toxic, so narcotic medication is extremely toxic, the more addictive something is, the more toxic it is. Okay, so caffeine. Caffeine is addictive. It is very toxic. Okay, you can kill yourself if you have too much caffeine in a day because it takes a lot of work to clear that caffeine molecule from the body. And so if you consume too much too quickly, it builds up and it can kill you. I don't think I've reached that limit. <laughs> I haven't discovered where that limit is. I'll let you know. Well, you know, every year there are, you know, Teenage boys, young boys, it's usually boys that are going to do this. Young men, you know, they drink too many monster drinks in a day and then they're in the ER. Gosh, yes. I just found out that there's new drinking games where teenagers or, co you know, college kids are playing basically beer pong, but with, with monsters or whatever. I think they're banging. Them. I'm like, oh, that's great. Please don't tell me these things. <laughs> like, one more thing to worry about. Yeah, scary. Exactly. So if we're taking, you know, a drug that is narcotic, that's going to be sort of the most toxic class of drugs. You can see that in the addictive nature of them. So in, in the migraine world, many people are given uh, Xanax or Ativan. Those are narcotic medications. Fioraset contains a narcotic as one of the medications in there. So, you know, no longer do you very commonly find doctors giving people opiate pain medication for migraines. That's really been uh, cracked down on for good reason, but occasionally you will even run into that. So if people are taking narcotic medication, you know, all medication is toxic. But once you get into that narcotic range, then it's going to be even more toxic. Well, and wow, I didn't even, obviously, the propensity to be addicted is something that we're very aware of. But I never realized that it was like a double whammy that you're not only risking addiction, but you're also making your migraine situation worse. Exactly. So I would say that while all medications are going to impact these three principles for everybody, there are certain medications that are particularly insidious in this aspect because they are very much adding blockers, right? It's, it's one thing where a medication, you know, depletes nutrients from the body because the body has to use up nutrients to process the medication. It's another thing to have a medication shut down your digestive tract. Mm, entirely right it's just sort of on like a whole nother level when you say shut down i i don't know shut down i'm i'm thinking about like all the microbiome and like there's a lot going on in the stomach that we don't 
normally think about. Does that damage those microbiome creatures as well? Uh huh. The little bacteria that, yes. that live in our I digestive tract. Them, I call them creatures in my house. No. <laughs> I know they they estimate that we have more bacteria and viruses and fungi living on and in us than we have actual cells in our body. Oh, that's crazy. Right. So it's a little it kind of begs the question, you know, who are we? (laughs) Who are we really? Well, and I find it so fascinating that they call it the second brain and how much it affects mental health. And like, that's something that never would have occurred to me 10 years ago. So very fascinating, our little tummies. Exactly. So those beneficial bacteria that are living in our digestive tract, or I should say they should be beneficial. They, they, they should be beneficial to us, but some of them are not beneficial to us. So the bacteria that is living in our digestive tract lives on the food that we eat. So the food that we eat dictates the bacteria that are going to thrive. So the bacteria, if we say take a Prilosec because we have heartburn, and that shuts down our stomach acid production, well, then if we aren't able to break the food down properly in the stomach, we're going to have food coming into the small intestine that's not prepared for what the small intestine does. So then we're going to have little undigested pieces of food. Well, guess what? The beneficial bacteria, they don't like it. They don't like that. The bad bugs, that's what they like to eat. So those are going to start to flourish. And don't the bad bugs, I mean, they like all the good food, (laughs) like sugar. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> From what I hear, they like to thrive on the things that we shouldn't enjoy, but do. <laughs> well, you know, the bacteria, they don't think of themselves as good or bad. No. <laughs> they don't have any bad intention. I, they have good self-esteem. <laughs> Right. So they they just thrive, right? Any bacteria, right? Different bacteria require different environments to live in. Like the bacteria that is coating my desk that I'm sitting at right now, that's not going to live inside of my digestive tract because that bacteria that's on my desk, it has to thrive in an, in an environment with oxygen and it's a much cooler environment that's inside than what is inside my digestive tract, right? So, you know, the bacteria that's sitting on our desk or countertop in our kitchen, if that gets on our food, that's going to die when it gets into our digestive tract because the environment is not appropriate for that type of bacteria. So it's the same thing with the bacteria that can live in our digestive tract. If the environment is right for them, they're going to grow and flourish. If the environment is not conducive for them, they're going to start to die off. So taking a probiotic, because this is probably your next question, okay, well then should I take probiotics. Why don't I just give, you know, I'll take a little capsule of the quote unquote good bacteria. Well, if the good bacteria don't have the environment that they thrive in, they're not going to live, even if we take a capsule once a day. So we're just putting a mandate on the situation, really. Exactly. They're just going to die off because the bacteria that are in our digestive tract are determined by the environment in our digestive tract. And, you know, the conventional medical community, you know, in the in the quote unquote alternative medicine or quote unquote natural medicine world, we've been talking about the microbiome, the good bacteria in the digestive tract. You know, when I got help from a chiropractor 25 years ago for my migraines, he told me the gut was the second brain. Sort of in my world, this has been just sort of taken for granted information. In conventional medicine, this is now the new hot thing. Oh, good. It only took 20 years to catch up. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, one of the studies that I recently saw was they took a collection of people who have a diagnosis of depression and they did some uh, stool samples and determined the bacteria that were in their digestive tracts. And then they looked for correlations and then determined, oh, this type of bacteria was in the digestive tract of, I don't remember the statistics, let's say 85% of the people with this diagnosis of depression. Therefore, maybe we should try to kill that bacteria and maybe that'll cure depression. Or, you know, let's give them probiotics that don't contain those bacteria and try to overpopulate the gut with bacteria that isn't in their digestive tract to cure the depression, right? This is what they're doing. So again, this is sort of this mindset, oh, well, somehow these bad bacteria got in your digestive tract. Something went wrong here. 
Let's try to fix it. That's not the case. There's nothing wrong with our digestive tract. When we have quote unquote bad bacteria, those bacteria are there because they're thriving in the environment of our digestive tract. So if we want to change the bacteria in the digestive tract, we have to change the environment in the digestive tract. That includes the food that we're putting into the digestive tract, the pH, right? We have a low pH in the stomach and we have a higher pH in the small intestine. We have to have the proper motility or movement through the digestive tract. There are sphincters between the stomach and the small intestine, between the small intestine and the large intestine. Those sphincters prevent things from kind of refluxing. Okay, Those sphincters have to be working properly. We have to have bowel movements, right? You can see that it's even more complex than the food that we're eating. Yes. And I <laughs> I don't know if I'm ever going to forgive you, Leslie, but I have not been able, every time I have any digestive issues, I'm like, I shouldn't even know about my digest- digestive system. <laughs> if it was working properly, I would not even know it was there. <laughs> like, I cannot get that out of my head. <laughs> right. But this is where we think it's just normal to have all these, you know, gas and gurgling and heartburn and hiccups and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, not good. So we got on a little bit. I got a little bit on a soapbox there around uh, beneficial gut bacteria, but hopefully that was helpful for people. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, well, I think it, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like we're talking about med- medication side effects, but in the big grand scheme of things, it's just one example of how messed up we can make our bodies by doing the wrong thing. How we can end up with side effects you know, just not to be too personal, but yeah, I struggle a lot with heartburn. And I think I've been taking some form of Prilosec or something for at least 10 years. And now it's to the point where I'm like, I'm so dependent on it. And it, I don't know, like, you just don't go into medicine and, you know, ask for help from the doctor thinking, oh boy, I hope this gets worse. You know what I mean? Like, I hope I can get some side effects and become dependent on this medication or even better, addicted. (laughs) You know, like, we don't think about that when we go into the doctor. But unfortunately, people have, you know, they have a symptom like heartburn, which is like a lower level symptom. It's not a very, you know, it's not a complex cluster of symptoms like a migraine is. It's one of the first symptoms that people will develop when they start to develop a blocker within these three principles. It's one of the first type of, types of symptoms that develops. And so we go in and then we get something to stop our body from generating the symptom, but then nothing is done to address, okay, why was this person getting the heartburn in the first place? And so again, a migraine sufferers, you know, the common refrain is, oh, my medication stops working. Every medication I take, eventually it stops working. That's not unique to migraine meds. 10 years later after Prilosec, well, uh, you know, I started at 20 milligrams. Now I got to take 40. Now I got to take it twice a day. This happens with every medication. And I'm not saying that you're doing that, Mary, but this is a common thing that I hear all the time from my clients taking Prilosec. I mean, and it's easy to fall into that trap if you're not educating yourself. If you don't, I mean, nobody told me like I said, 10 years ago, that this could lead to worse problems. It's like when you go to the mechanic and they they tell you like A, B, and C is wrong, but they don't mention that you're going to blow a tire and an engine soon enough because you know what I'm saying? Like they don't warn you 10 years down the road most of the time. Most of the time when you go, they just fix the immediate problem. Well, yeah. Well, if if our mechanics operated like our doctors operated, if when that check engine light comes on in the dashboard and we take it into the mechanic, if our mechanic was a conventional medical doctor, the mechanic would take a little pliers and cut the wire to the dashboard light and say, there you go. The light's off. You're good to go. (laughs) <laughs> well thank you very much <laughs> like or like when the the gas or not gas light the oil needs to be changed and that light comes on it's like okay we're gonna just dump more oil in here but we're never gonna take out what's m- the old stuff that's messing well up again uh, your medical doctor when you get that prescription your medical doctor is simply removing the bulb in the dashboard that illuminates the low oil light Interesting. I am not much of a mechanic minded person, but like that makes so much sense in an analogy way. It would be one thing if they were actually adding oil, right? Because adding oil to the car, I mean, the car needs oil. 
right? Now, maybe, you know, again, if there's like a little, and I know nothing about cars either, but right, if I have to go once a month and add oil to my car, right? Okay, there's there's gotta be some, some hole here. There's gotta be some reason why this car is going through oil. But at least in that situation, I'm actually adding what the car needs. I may not have identified why I need to do it every month, but at least I'm adding something that the car needs. Your medical doctor is not doing that. Your medical doctor is just snipping the wire that is sending the light to light up to tell you there's something wrong. Okay, we're just gonna, we're just not gonna send that signal that something's wrong. That's scary. That's really scary when you start to really think about it. I like this analogy that you brought up, actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this more. A functional medicine doctor, what they're doing is they just keep adding oil every month, but not really getting to the root of why the oil keeps leaking out. What we want to do, right, is we want to determine why do I have to fill up this oil every month? What is actually going on here? We want to get it at the true root level. Every doctor, even conventional medical doctors say that they treat the root cause. That's like the mechanic saying, yeah, I got to the bottom of the problem. I took the light bulb out. It was the light bulb that was generating the dashboard warning. <laughs> it's that's the thing that scares you right it's like okay <laughs> yeah technically that... yes you're right the reason why the dashboard <laughs> light came on is because of the light bulb okay technically that's true right but that's not what we really <laughs> that's not what we really want is a root cause analysis well then okay let's take this one step further and go back to side effects if the doctor takes out the light bulb and the functional medicine doctor um pours the, the oil in the tank the, sim- the side effects are probably coming from where? Like, I don't know if you or myself know enough about mechanics to actually finish <laughs> this analogy. But we well, the that. difference is, right, so <laughs> when I take my car in and the mechanic just simply takes the light bulb out of the dash so that there's no warning light coming on, right? The difference is eventually if there's no oil in the car, see, the car is not alive. The car cannot adapt to not having enough oil. And so eventually the car will break down and we will be forced to confront the problem. Right. <laughs> I'm struggling because I I literally just have been facing car problems this week. My poor 21-year-old son had his engine blow up on the freeway and he was a good 40 minutes away from home at one o'clock in the morning. So this is really a big issue for me right now. <laughs> but, Yes, when you ignore a problem in a car long enough, it blows yeah, up. Yeah, you got to call mom at one in the morning. <laughs> and mom's happy because she lost all her sleep and it just is a problem. Right, <laughs> exactly. But our bodies adapt. We can run for a long time on no oil. We can run for decades. We're not going to feel well, but we can run for decades and decades and decades with no oil in the tank. When I think as women... We're so prone to doing that. We are so prone to being like, "Uh, I'll get the oil light or, you know, I'll get the oil changed and the light checked six months from now, a year from now. Like there's so many other fires we're putting out, taking care of families and working hard. It's so easy to let that hit the back burner, you know? For sure. Interesting. I think that like back to side effects again, it's just, I don't, I say this often in the group, you don't have to choose between debilitating side effects and debilitating migraines. And I think that's why you are doing what you do, because women shouldn't have to choose between those. There are more options and working with you is another is that option. Like you don't have to choose between losing your hair, losing your memory, gaining weight, being sick from the side effects to avoid the migraines. Correct. Absolutely. And this is what, you know, when we did that poll in the group, uh, would you rather have migraines or debilitating side effects? People choose the debilitating side effects all the time. And they, you know, because they don't realize that they can actually restore and recover their health, their bodies stop generating these migraines, they can feel better as a whole person. You know, when I'm working with my clients, you know, a rising tide lifts all of the boats, right? So people come to me, they frankly, they don't care about the other very debilitating symptoms that they have, they just want the migraines to go away. But you know, here's the deal, when our health improves, all of those symptoms start to improve. So again, we are so fixated on the migraine. Sometimes we lose sight of how much better we could feel as a whole person, physically, mentally, emotionally. It's really sad. I just wish women would stop choosing between 
it's like which is the lesser version of hell here <laughs> like you know yeah you're absolutely right that's what people are doing because they aren't aware of any other alternatives so interesting well very good mary thanks for joining me today yeah good chat <laughs> <laughs>